Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm Councilmember Robert Cornegy, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. We're here today to hold a hearing on two topics that relate directly to the safety of New Yorkers, construction safety and elevator safety. 2017 saw 650 construction-related accidents and 81 fatalities that same year. The Council enacted Local Law 196, which requires construction safety training for workers. At this morning's hearing, we'll hear a pre-considered bill that extends the June 1, 2019 compliance deadline required under Local Law 196 until December so that more workers can comply with the training requirements. In addition to this pre-considered bill, today we'll hold a hearing about elevators. There are approximately 63,000 elevator, elevators in the city under the pre purview of the Department of Buildings. In 2017, the DOB issued 4,816 elevator-related violations. Elevators are required to be inspected twice a year by third-party inspection agencies conducting inspections on DOB's behalf. When these inspections identify violations, the building owners are required to correct the violations within 60 days or else they will face penalties. <clears throat> In 2019, there were two high-profile elevator-related incidents. This past January, a woman was stuck in an elevator for three days before she was rescued. In March, a woman died when she was stuck in a homeless shelter freight elevator while suffering an overdose. Previously, in 2015, an individual was crushed to death in an elevator on a residential building in Williamsburg. Although nearly half of elevator-related accidents involve passengers, the majority of elevator-related deaths involve elevator mechanics. The elevator mechanic industry is not regulated. Elevator mechanics are not licensed by the DOB. As a result, elevator mechanics who are tasked with performing dangerous and important work frequently put their lives in danger. One of the bills we're hearing today will address the gap in elevator me mechanic training. Proposed intro 788A, sponsored by Council Member Torres, will create a licensing scheme for elevator and elevator maintenance com companies and their directors and require certification for elevator maintenance company mechanics. Intro number 786 and 787 also sponsored by Council Member Torres, relate to elevator brake monitors and elevator monitoring systems. An elevator brake monitor is designed to identify when the elevator is running through its brakes in order to shut down or reset the elevator. Remote elevator monitoring systems allow building owners to monitor elevator systems. Intro 786 requires the DOB to report on whether brake monitors and remote electronic monitoring systems enhance elevator safety and whether requiring installation of these brake monitors and monitoring systems in all residential buildings will be feasible. Intro 787 requires the maintenance of breaker monitors and elevator monitoring systems if they are installed in elevators. Today, we'll also be hearing a number of other bills related to ensuring the safety of elevator passengers. Intro 374, sponsored by Council Member Rose, would make retroactive secondary power for lighting the egress paths in elevators. Intro 414, sponsored by Council Member Chin, will require safety signs in elevators. These signs would instruct elevator passengers on, on what to do if there is an elevator malfunction. Intro 565, sponsored by Council Member Trigger, will require certain buildings to maintain elevator service outage accommodation plans and also to provide reasonable accommodations to residents with disabilities while a passenger elevator will be out of service for more than 24 hours. Finally, Intro 1508, sponsored by Council Member Levine, will require vents in elevator hoistway enclosures to be closed to prevent air leakage. This would save energy and, as a result, money for building owners. I'd like to thank my fellow committee members, Council Member Perkins and Council Member Grudenchik, who are present here today, and acknowledge any other Council Member presidents who are not. Um, I'd also just like to remind you that if you would like to testify today, please fill out a card with the sergeant. We'll be sticking to a two-minute clock for public testimony. And now we'll administer the oath of the administration before testimony. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Great. I do. Great. Good morning. Good morning. Begin your testimony. Thank you. Uh, if you could just please identify yourself for the record. 
Good morning, Chair Carnegie and members of the Housing and Buildings Committee. I am Patrick A. Whaley, Assistant Commissioner for External Affairs at the New York City Department of Buildings. I'm joined by my colleague, Charanjeet Singh, who's our Executive Engineer of the Department's Elevator Division. We are pleased to be here to offer testimony on several bills before the committee today related to elevators and a proposed extension for complying with safety training under Local Law 196. There are nearly 76,000 elevator devices under the department's jurisdiction, which represent over 8% of all elevators nationwide. Each day, millions of New Yorkers ride in the city ele city's elevators, which make approximately 38 million runs, or about 500 trips per elevator per day. The department now publishes on its website an interactive map on all the city's elevators, including their location, history, and current status. The department's highest obligation is to protect the safety of the public by enforcing laws and regulation regulations that govern the city's 1.1 million buildings. And this important work certainly includes the installation and operation of elevators. In 2018, there were 45 elevator accidents, 42 of which were minor in nature. This represents a reduction of approximately 60% since 2007, when there were 105 accidents. Elevators are statistically the safest means of travel in New York City. They are safer than elevators nationally, and are safer now than they have been for as long as accurate records have been kept. The safety of the city's elevators can be credited in part to the rigorous laws and regulations that govern them. The New York City Building Code requires that every elevator be tested at least once and inspected at least twice annually by department licensed individuals with an additional in-depth inspection required every five years. The results of such inspections must be submitted to the department in a timely manner. If defects are detected during the inspections, building owners are required to submit proof that an action has been carried out to correct the defect. Additionally, the code requires owners to have a current maintenance contract with a private elevator inspection agency available to perform elevator work. The department's elevator unit is responsible for enforcing the applicable laws and regulations that govern the operational safety, reliability, and lawful use of elevators. The elevator unit does this by reviewing plans for elevators, performing work and witnessing inspections and tests, responding to complaints, and conducting investigations following elevator accidents. The elevator unit primarily issues violations for failure to submit inspection and test reports in a timely manner and for failure to properly maintain elevators, which can be issued where defects are discovered following a complaint-based inspection by the department. The department licenses private elevator inspection agency directors and inspectors. Building owners must hire licensed directors and their staff of licensed inspectors who are responsible for performing elevator work, including installations, replacements, maintenance, repairs, inspections, and tests. Directors must be a registered design professional with a minimum of five years of relevant experience or must have a minimum of 10 years relevant experience. Inspectors must have a minimum of seven years of relevant, relevant experience. While the department licenses directors and inspectors, there are no formal qualification requirements for the mechanics working under such directors and inspectors who perform the elevator work. As such, the department is supportive of efforts to require enhanced training and education for individuals performing elevator work and has been working with the state legislature to accomplish this goal. A bill was introduced in the state legislature last session, and again this session, that would require additional training for directors and inspectors and create a new elevator agency technician license. Technicians, who are otherwise referred to as mechanics, would be responsible for performing elevator work and would be required to have OSHA 10 training and complete a department-sponsored exam and have five years of relevant experience or complete a four-year apprenticeship program. Proposed introductory number 788A would create an elevator maintenance company director license. Directors would be responsible for overseeing elevator work, which could be performed by such director, by an elevator maintenance company mechanic, or an elevator maintenance company helper, or an apprentice enrolled in an apprenticeship program. Directors would be required to be a registered design professional with five years of relevant experience or have 10 years of relevant experience. Mechanics would be required to have five years of relevant experience with 36 hours of additional training, or must have completed a three-year apprenticeship, apprenticeship program. As previously mentioned, the department is supportive of efforts to require enhanced training and education for individuals who perform elevator work, referred to as technicians or mechanics. Proposed intro 788A does not require that such bill individuals be licensed. The bill would only require that elevator maintenance company directors be licensed, but not the elevator maintenance company mechanics working under them. This framework would create a buffer between such mechanics and the department would prevent the department from disciplining such mechanics, thereby creating a safety concern for the department. 
Park looks forward to discussing the shared goal of improving elevator safety by strengthening the qualifications of individuals who perform elevator work and by bringing such individuals into the department's regulatory framework, further with this committee and the bill's sponsor. Introductory number 341 would require that certain existing buildings provide a standby power system for their elevators. Further, it would require that certain existing buildings provide an emergency power system for exit signs and means of egress illumination and emergency voice communication systems. Emergency power backup systems can improve safety in the event of emergency, including a power outage. While requirements to provide emergency backup power systems, including standby power and emergency, and, uh, emergency power, already apply to new buildings, including high-rise buildings, it can be quite challenging for existing buildings to comply with these requirements, particularly when weighed against the relative infrequency of power outages. For example, installing a standby generator in an existing building would require a significant amount of space, including space for fuel oil storage, could present constraints associated with installing necessary venting and piping, and could trigger certain fire protection requirements as well. The department is exploring this proposal further to fully understand the challenges it may face for existing buildings. Intro 414 would require that signs be posted within elevators in new existing buildings, instructing passengers on what to do in the event of an elevator malfunction. The department supports this bill as it would build upon our existing outreach concerning how to ride an elevator safely, provided existing buildings are giving sufficient time to comply. Intro 565 would require the owners of certain residential buildings to provide reasonable accommodations during outages longer than a day when requested by an affected resident with a disability. While the department supports this proposal, which could be enforced along with other similar ele elevator-related notifications, it should not be responsible for determining what a reasonable accommodation for a resident with a disability should be, given that it does not have the relevant expertise in this area. The department also suggests including an additional ex exception where there is another el passenger elevator servicing the building or a section of the building affected by the outage. Intro 786 and 787 are both related to elevator brake monitors and brake monitoring systems. Intro 786 would require the department to analyze whether brake monitors and monitoring systems enhance elevator safety, and if so, the feasibility of requiring the installation of such monitors and systems on all elevators in residential buildings. The department is supportive of this proposal and would like to explore for this issue further through the New York City Construction Code's revision process, which is currently underway. The department is also supportive of Intro 787, which would require owners to maintain brake monitors and monitoring systems on an annual basis where such monitors or systems are installed. Intro 1508 would require owners of existing buildings to partially close elevator hoistway vents in their buildings to mitigate air leakage, and owners of new buildings to install automated hoistway vents so that elevator hoistway vents in such buildings remain closed to prevent air leakage. The department is supportive of requiring that elevator hoistway vents be enclosed in new buildings. The department is exploring the issue further as part of the New York City Construction Code revision process and looks forward to discussing this issue further with the committee and the bill sponsor. Turning now to uh, construction safety and Local Law 196, uh, the pre-considered introduction before the committee amends Local Law 196 of 2017, which requires construction site safety training for workers on many of the city's building construction projects. Construction work is inherently dangerous, and our goal as a department is to limit accidents to the greatest extent possible. Local Law 196 was crafted with the laudable intent of requiring construction workers to receive comprehensive safety training so they can perform their work as safely as possible at the end of their shift, make it home to their families safely. Furthermore, the law included ambitious timetables for safety training to be received so that workers can get the comprehensive and effective training they need as quickly as possible. Local Law 196 requires workers on building construction projects that require department licensed safety professionals to ultimately have 40 hours of site safety training. In addition, supervisors on those sites will be required to have 62 hours of safety training. In recognition of the significant number of hours proposed, Local Law 196 provided that the training be implement implemented not only in phases, but with the opportunity for the department to push back certain deadlines if it determined that an insufficient number of workers have received training. Local Law 196 required workers to have 10 hours of safety training by March 1st of 2018. From there, the law required that by December 1st of 2018, workers were to have 30 hours of safety training and supervisors were required to have 62 hours of safety training. As previously mentioned, the law allowed the department to push back the December deadline to June 1st of this year if the department determined that an insufficient number of workers and supervisors have received the training. 
Following consultation with the Site Safety Training Task Force, the Department pushed back the deadline to June 1st of this year. Finally, the remaining 10 hours of training for workers is required by September 1st of 2020. Specifically, this preconsidered introduction pushes back the June 1st, 2019 deadline an additional six months to December 1st of 2019. The bill leaves the September 1st, 2020 deadline intact. Recognizing the critical importance of this issue, the Department has devoted a considerable amount of time and effort to the law's implementation. Specifically, the Department has hosted and participated in dozens of information sessions for well over 1,000 industry professionals, worked with the Site Safety Training Task Force to establish course topics and guidelines, along with determining the total number of hours of training required for workers and supervisors, hosted quarterly meetings with the Site Safety Training Task Force to discuss implementation of the law, We've issued several service notices to industry members, remind, reminding them of the law's requirements and keeping them apprised of our implementation efforts. And we've distributed many thousands of materials, including palm cards and multiple languages, providing information to workers and their employers on the law's requirements. While the department has concerns with pushing the deadline back, we, like you, have heard from a diverse array of industry representatives expressing the challenges they face in complying with the ambitious June deadline provided in the law. In addition, many of our fellow members on the Site Safety Training Task Force, which was established by Local Law 196, have expressed the same concerns. As such, the Department has no objection to the Council's bill extending the interim training compliance deadline for a period of six months. That said, such an extension should not be used as an excuse to delay this important, potentially life-saving training. The sooner our construction workers get trained, the better for both workers and the public. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and uh, Chowanjeet and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, we'll begin with the question period. So um, I'll just start. Um, so according to our number, there are approximately 63,000 elevators in the New York, in New York City buildings. Is that a correct number? Uh, it, it really depends exactly how you want to choose to or define elevators. Um, if you define it based on active elevator devices that are under jurisdiction of the buildings department, that's numbers a little bit higher. It's just shy of 76,000 buildings. Elevators, rather, sorry. I didn't realize we could uh, evaluate the definition of elevators, I thought. They're all, and by how we classify it, they're all different types. Obviously, there are passenger and freight elevators, some people would include escalators in that as a people-moving device. There are dumb waiters. There's a list of several. So offline, I'd like to definitely kind of dive into that and tease apart so that we have a correct number and the correct definition, because that's kind of what we're basing even this hearing on is, is that number. And I didn't realize there were so many different variations that the building department. Uh, I, have a, I have a table that breaks out all the different types that I'm happy to provide the committee with at the conclusion. If we can get a copy of that, that'd be awesome. No problem. Um, so how many buildings would you say are, at this number, we're going to have to talk about the number, but uh, from your estimation, how many buildings are equipped with standby power? So we don't track the number of buildings that have standby power. What I can tell you is that with the enactment of the 2014 um, construction codes, that code required new buildings to have standby power. So since the enactment of the 2014 code, there's been roughly 31,300 new building permits that were issued, but the number with standby power wouldn't be quite so high because that includes even smaller buildings and types of buildings that wouldn't require it. So we can look into this further and get back to you with a more specific number. So I, listen, I, I respect and want to get back to that number and there'll probably be a couple of points. Um, I just appreciate the fact that you have a number. In the past, we've we've you know, in, in prior hearings, not just with this committee, but we've heard that we don't, we don't know. And the fact that you're at least reporting a number um, is, is, uh, is laudable, so I really appreciate that. Um, how many buildings, again, with standby power have elevators? And I, I understand based on what you've said earlier that it's tough to define that, but if you could give us some range. 
Yeah, whether it be standby power generally or standby power with elevators, the, the same rule holds, right? We, we don't keep track of that. We receive a filing. If it requires standby power, we review that filing to make sure it's there. Our inspections are performed to ensure that it's there. But it's the 2014 code that required this in new buildings. Since 2014, we've issued just over 31,000 new building permits, and we can go through that data in a little more detail to arrive at a specific number. Okay, uh, do you happen to have any idea what the cost to install a standby power system in a small building and a large building? So, so two different costs the, in, in a small building, what the cost of standby power to be installed would be, and one, in a larger building. So once again, sorry, I don't have an exact answer for you. What I can tell you is that certainly those professionals who perform those installations would certainly be able to give you a better idea. Um, however, like as we mentioned in our testimony, installing such, such systems is more challenging for existing buildings because they might not have the space for them. So it's really a building by building type issue. And for existing buildings, many of whom may not have the space to install this, there could very well be any different number of sort of modifications that they would need to make um, to their building to accommodate such a system. And depending on that building, that would really dictate the expense involved. Okay, so, so the next series of questions has to do with um, uh, emergency power. But before I ask those questions, can you define for me the difference between standby power and emergency power? For that, I'll pass it over to my colleague, uh, Charanji, to answer. The requirement for emergency power is that it has to, once the power is lost, the emergency power kicks in within 10 seconds, and the standby power kicks in within 60 seconds. I'm sorry. Just so I understand, in 10 seconds of a power outage, emergency power kicks in. Right. And then subsequently after that, 50 seconds later? Yes. So the emergency power is a, is a temporary powering system, which is overridden by standby power. Not exactly. So what happens is there are systems that will continue to run on emergency power, and that may be lighting for exit, exit signs and things like that, ventilations in, let's say, in the elevator. Uh, those will continue to run on emergency power. But standby power can go beyond that. The emergency power will be maintained for those essential systems so that in case of emergency, people can still at least see the exit sign. The elevator will be required to run on standby power, so when the emergency uh, respondents do come, they'll be able to use that device on standby power. So again, for the record, uh, both emergency power and standby power run concurrently at yes. some point during an outage? Yes. Okay. Um, so how many, how many buildings of the universe that we've come up with, the number that we've come up with, actually run, are equipped with emergency power? You know that number? So the same sort of rule applies as for the other questions as well. It's not something that we track. There are, it's required for new construction, 31,000 roughly permits, and we can try and dive into that to arrive at a specific number. So you said earlier that you, you, uh, the question about um, the cost of installing um, um, the cost of installing uh, standby power would be better asked of the installers. Is it the same for emergency? We don't have a number? That's correct. That's not something that we really are involved in. Okay. How many buildings are equipped with emergency power to light egress paths? Once again, uh, it's the requirement in new construction in the 2014 code. Mm -hmm. Roughly 31,000 buildings have been permitted, new buildings under that code, and we can dive into that number to, to arrive at a specific. So uh, just for the record, uh, buildings that were built after 2014 are required to have the emergency power for uh, egress lighting, for lighting egress ways. Correct. However, not every single new building, only certain kinds of buildings. So like a smaller, you know, one, two, three family home, this would not be required for that. Um, so, but certain types are dropped out. But yes, for, for many types of buildings, larger buildings in particular, this is a requirement for new construction as of the 2014 code. Is it every new building with an elevator system? I think most likely they would, uh, well, if it's a, once again, if it's a private residence and they can have an elevator, it would not be required. I don't know how many buildings in my district have an elevator in a private residence. So let me. There aren't too many of those, but as a general matter, you're referring to multiple dwellings with elevators. Yes, yes, yes. the answer to your question is yes. Right. So if there is, just for the record, if there's a building that has an elevator that was built after 2014, it has the requirement to have the emergency power that lights the egress. With some very, building. very limited exceptions, the answer to your question is yes. 
Can you articulate for me those limited exceptions? Again, if it happens to be a private residence that happens to have an elevator, I don't think that requirement would be in place, that, right? That correct, yeah. But for multiple dwellings generally, which represents the overwhelming bulk of residential new construction, the answer to your question is yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so um, does the administration support intro 341? So we do, as I mentioned, require this for new construction. The bill provides that this will be applied to existing um, construction as well. We're not in a position as of yet to say that we support it because there would be a lot of challenges associated with performing these modifications to existing buildings to provide for the standby power that may not have space for it. So it's something we'll need to sort of think more. We'd be curious to hear from uh, you know, the industry and what their concerns are, but it's something we need to look into further to, to better understand what the challenges are associated with, with providing that in existing buildings. Thank you. I do want to uh, recognize we've been joined by uh, Councilmember Rosenthal, Rosenthal and Councilmember Rivera. Um, I just want to ask one before I have uh, other members of the committee who'd like to ask questions. Intro 414 in relation to site safety, si to safety signs and elevators. Does the city collect data on how many passengers are injured due to malfunction in elevators? And if so, how many passengers were injured? So we do. So as I mentioned, uh, we had uh, 45 elevator accidents in 2018. Um, three of the 45 were considered to be serious. And of those three serious accidents, one of which was the result of a mechanical issue, so a malfunction in the elevator. I'm sorry, how many fatalities, if any? Uh, in 2018, we had one fatality. How many, in, how many stalled elevator companies, I'm sorry, how many stalled elevator complaints were re reported to 311 in 2017? Actually, is that the only mechanism for reporting problems with elevators is through 311? As a general matter, that's right. Okay, so when was the most common elevator, what was the most common elevator complaint? So uh, last year, 2018, we received 15,127 elevator-related complaints, and predominantly those complaints relate to the elevator not working, not being inspected, or was installed without a permit. Do you know how many of those reports were about NYCHA properties? Uh, not offhand, but we can work to see if we can isolate that and share it with the committee. Yeah, that, that, would, be, that would be awesome to know. Um, in your opinion, in your expert opinion, uh, would safety si signs and elevators increase the safety of passengers? I think any opportunity that we have to perform further outreach to those who are traveling in elevators about what they should be doing in an elevator in case of a malfunction would certainly be helpful, and such a sign in therefore would be helpful and would build on our existing outreach efforts, yes. I just want to follow up. I believe that in your testimony you said that the uh, administration supports this particular bill. Can you confirm or deny that? I can confirm that. Thank you. I, uh, my colleagues have questions. First is Councilmember Rosenthal. Thank you so much, Chair, and great to see you, Deputy Commissioner. Good morning. Commissioner, person who knows everything about Department of Buildings. Um, I cannot confirm that. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So um, let me just ask real quickly, because uh, there was an important exchange right now about um, uh, elevator complaints. Um, in my district, when there is an elevator outage, often the fire department is called um, to come in and, and fix things. Does that happen via 311? It can happen through 311 in a situation as you're describing, depending on who receives it first, we can get a referral directly from the fire department. And those types of issues that you're describing, we prioritize those complaints and we go out there right away. DOB does or fire department? We would probably both wind up there together. We would take a look as well. Okay, do calls ever go to the fire department directly? I think it depends. They don't have to, no. Someone might be calling 911 and it would be dispatched appropriately or through 311 and it would be dispatched appropriately as well. The only reason I ask if, if we want to get our arms around the, the uh, demand, the amount of times this happens, it'd be helpful maybe to get the information about FDNY as well. Um, in the situations that I'm aware of, I haven't heard about DOB coming out. It's really just fire department. 
So, uh, you know, as a general matter, when it comes to out outages or any elevator-related issue, um, the department does go out to take a look. This kind of situation you're describing is, is something we prioritize and we get out there right away. Uh, wait, for, for one second. Um, so, I do want uh, to piggyback off um, Councilmember Rosenthal's question. The, the fire safety director's role in an outage is what exactly? Because I know that there is the fire safety director is called, the fire department is called, DOB is called. I'm wondering if the, the fire safety director um, who has purview in buildings, uh, obviously when there's a fire, but sometimes when there's outages, what role do they play in an outage and when are they called? So the fire safety director is not required in all buildings. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. The fire safety director is, is not required. Is your mic required. on? I'm sorry. Oh, is it? Okay, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, okay. So fire safety director is not required in all buildings. So okay, so. Usually in case of emergency, I think um, everybody just calls 911. And depending on the severity of uh, the incident, fire department will obviously respond. And if it, maybe if there's a stuck passenger, they'll get them out. And in that process, they always refer back to us so that we can okay. come out and inspect the device, make sure that it is safe for passenger use before it's returned back to service. So generally, how quickly is DOB notified of an outage or, or the absence of the use of a elevator? Because obviously they're calling, if, if somebody dials 911, the fire department comes out, uh, they realize that there's no one stuck in the elevator, the elevator's down, what's usually the, next pro the process next? The first thing, obviously, the fire department is going to do is uh, safety of passenger. They have to get the passengers out. I think and once they're done with that procedure, um, you know, that's the time when they will usually refer it to us. And we handle that as uh, a A-type complaint, urgent, and we respond right away. Is there, is there a timeline uh, internal to DOB that triggers? Like, for example, um, you know, obviously, we have timelines around 30, you know, with legislation, you got 30, 60, 90 days that you have to report. Is there a, is there amount of time uh, that DOB has to come out on site to inspect um, uh, an elevator outage? So the, the the situation that you're describing, as Charanjit mentioned, we prioritize as an A complaint, and so our service level for A complaints is to get out there within 24 hours. Given the service, le given the severity of this type of complaint, we we arrive on scene close to immediately. We leave right away. How many, how many DOB elevators, elevator inspectors do you have? Um, the total team, I think, consists of 51. It includes chiefs, supervisors, and inspectors. I'm sorry, council member. Thank you very much for that follow-up. Um, so, and I just want to clarify that I heard you say that you could Currently, or would it take some time to go back, click a button, and identify how many calls are from NYCHA buildings versus everyone else? Uh, certainly happy to, to, uh, to try and get back to the committee as soon as possible with that information. About whether or not it's possible or with that number? Uh, both, but we should be able to get the number. Okay. And then similarly, do you track by address repeat calls? I have a building or... 12 in my district where it feels like every other week the elevator is going out and people are stuck and what do you do with those locations where there are repeat calls? So we do keep track of repeat calls and again depending on the circumstances surrounding that um, it may be the kind of building where we'd be giving more attention uh, up to including performing proactive inspections to ensure those elevators are running properly. Why, just from a residence, if you, could, if you could think about it from a residence point of view, and I don't quite know how to frame this question, but one lives in a building where there are frequent calls, FDNY comes out, gets somebody out, and that's happening every couple of weeks. A, should a resident feel like they're living in a dangerous building? Um, should a resident, is there, does this mean a Band-Aid is being put on for a fix and not a, you know, a real structural fix? 
Did, what, and lastly, do you know, again, click of a button today or um, at some point, where you could find, oh, at these X number of buildings, we get calls once a month. So we can um, prepare such a list for you. Um, as it relates to, you know, um, repeat complaints about sort of, let's just say, for the sake of argument, bad actor buildings, we do maintain records and we sort of put them into a, cer a separate universe where we give them extra attention, as I mentioned, perform inspections. Um, to the extent that there are, in fact, um, outages in elevator service uh, with great frequency or just an elevator outage that they're not taking the proper due diligence to correct, we have tools in place to help ensure that that work happens, up to and including a recently acting law that puts elevators into the HPD's emergency repair program. Yeah, exactly. So in the event that um, an owner is not taking proper steps to bring their elevator back to service, we have the ability now to make referrals to HPD that they will take, go through a series of steps to consider for inclusion in the emergency repair pl plan. And, and I think since that law has been in effect, it's been somewhat successful, not so much in bringing these buildings and their elevators into that program, but the mere threat of that happening has been somewhat convincing as a general matter to these bad actor landlords to do a little bit of a better job to get their elevators back online faster than they otherwise would. Um, but in response to my first question, like as a resident living in those buildings, what is regular outages, is that something where their lives are in danger? where potentially, like, I don't know what the reasons are. I'm not a mechanical engineer. Is that, like, worrisome or just like, oh, yeah, it's like a little scratch. Just put a Band-Aid on it. It's fine. Or is it like, oh, no, this is a indicator that, you know, this elevator could really crap out and somebody could plunge to their death. And I'm sure it's somewhere in between, but... So, you know, the situation you're describing, it, it runs the gamut. It could be a serious problem. It could be something relatively insignificant. That said, as we mentioned in our testimony, elevators go through several inspector inspections every single year. And part of that inspection is our inspectors, be it DOB inspectors or private inspectors, have a very long checklist of things that they look for. And in the event they see something there that's not right, be it a simple maintenance issue like poor lighting, or maybe perhaps it's something more significant like a problem with the door, they will go ahead and issue a violation, depending on the severity, ask that the elevator be, require that the elevator be cease use until it's fixed. So the city, in a number of ways, has its eyes on elevators, and we look at these elevators, putting aside complaints, of which we receive many, many times throughout an individual year for all the elevators throughout the city under our jurisdiction. Let me put it a different way. For, some, for an elevator to plunge, that wouldn't be because the doors don't open. It'd be because the cables are broken or near broken. How many times, I'm assuming, how many times in the course of a year, how many buildings do you see that are in that very severe situation? Uh, I think that's only a fear because we have multiple levels of safeties in um, an elevator uh, to prevent that from happening. <coughs> so even uh, that's an extreme case if you lost all First of all, there's a um, safety factor of 10, basically, I can tell you that. 10, 11, that, uh, you know, we have backup ropes. Even in the worst case scenario, I'm saying if you, you know, lose all the ropes, we still have safeties that would apply and prevent the elevator from, from a free fall. So, um, but I, of course, most people don't know that. <laughs> sort of want to just clarify that yes. for people. And, um, how many buildings uh, most recently have you referred over to the AEP program? So uh, last year um, we made uh, 162 referrals to HPD. And are they all unique addresses? Uh, good question, don't know the answer. Most if not all, I would say. And. Were any of those 162 NYCHA buildings? Uh, no idea, but I can follow up on that. So I just want to say that um, we've asked for follow-up on uh, a lot of different things. I don't know if you made notes of it or you, or you re oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> 
trust is that. Um, I, um, <clears throat> okay, hang on one second. Thank you, I'm done. No problem. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, we're gonna move on, do we have other, anybody else? Uh, we're going to move on to intro 565, which is in relation to elevator service outage accommodations. Um, my first question is, is there a um, age or date of elevator usage that triggers uh, a recommendation for replacement of an elevator? So I think I'd answer the question by saying, you know, the average age of an elevator varies greatly. We actually have elevators in this city that are functioning just fine that have been doing so for 100 years. Um, the important thing is that they be maintained properly, all right? That said, as a general matter, um, around 15 to 20 years is about the lifespan of an elevator where it requires major modifications. I just want to point out that we've been joined uh, by Councilmember Joni and now Councilmember Torres. Um, how many buildings, uh, in your estimation, would be impacted by Intro 565? So uh, the bill would impact residential buildings um, with elevators, um, and I think we're going to need a little bit of time just to sort of, again, drill down into what that number is, and we'll be able to get that information for the committee. Is it possible, not today, but in the future, to provide us with a breakdown per council district on where these buildings are located? So that number, the overall number, and then uh, to further drill down on where they're located. Again, I think one of the questions for this council is, you know, the maintenance of elevators in the NYCHA development. I would like to assume that they're not excluded from the number that we're talking about, and that there's not a separate treatment for those elevators and the service of those elevators. Um, I, I'd like you to answer that part now. Like, is there, is there a certain, is there a separate methodology for treatment of elevators in the NYCHA system? And if so, we'd like to know how, that, how that's dealt with. So the city has a memorandum of understanding with NYCHA that's been in place for quite some time, whereby NYCHA is responsible for the maintenance of their own elevators. Clearly, if there is an, in, an incident or some kind of an accident, we'll, report, we'll arrive to investigate, but the NYCHA is responsible for their own uh, elevator maintenance per this MOU. So, so, so let me be clear, the, 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 uh, the general maintenance of elevators in the NYCHA system are, is NYCHA's responsibility. So NYCHA's uh, engineers and architects and are responsible for that. Is there any time that the Department of Buildings is called in to either review those systems, shut those systems down, um, give recommendations on the maintenance of those systems? So based on complaints, we go out and check, installations, we go out and check, and periodic inspections as well. So we do have a presence at NYCHA buildings. Oh, on NYCHA a, building. Correct, yes. Okay, um, so, and listen, this is not an indictment of uh, DOB per se, but, but the lion's share of the complaints I get in my district about elevator operations or failed operations is in the NYCHA system. And so I'm very concerned that, you know, they're two, they're two separate systems and we can't pin down what, like we'd like to as a body, the safety and concerns of NYCHA residents versus the safety and the, the, the safety of general residents of the city of New York. And if they're two different systems, you, it'd be great to know that now we would certainly like to see um, DOB have purview as well and have the same steps associated. So if a NYCHA resident calls 311 about a down elevator, it's directed to the NYCHA system and not DOB? We, we do go out. So once again, they, the, their elevators are not do, no difference. They are under our jurisdiction and they have to comply with the same safety rules that are applicable to everybody. They're not exempt from that. No, no, no. I, I, I don't believe that they're exempt. I just believe that they're on another track, meaning, um, meaning the calls, meaning um, I think it was alluded to by the commissioner that there is a certain degree of maintenance that's, that falls under the purview of NYCHA and is responsible to NYCHA. So my belief would be that people who are making those complaints are not making them to the Department of Buildings, uh, but making them to NYCHA. 
So just to be clear, sorry, we do perform inspections on complaints related to elevators in NYCHA buildings. I think the distinction that I was getting at is NYCHA has its own staff who are responsible for the maintenance of those elevators. Okay. Yeah, and unfortunately we've seen some scandals recently around that, but that's a whole other story. Understood. That's a, an that's a, that's a issue for another hearing, but I, I just want to make sure, though, that we're clear and that this body is clear about the purview. I, I want to turn this into a NYCHA hearing, but that um, the responsibility of the maintenance and safety of individuals riding elevators in the NYCHA system is not separate from the Department of Building. Correct. The Buildings Department does have oversight over that work. And just to get to the other part of your question that you had asked, um, the Buildings Department has this really cool um, interactive map on our website relative to elevators. So you can actually search by community board district and get a thorough understanding of all the elevators that are in there and what their status is and their history. So that's a resource for the public and the council to utilize. And, and that's not teased out by uh, general uh, buildings, general private buildings, as opposed to it includes all it includes all buildings in our jurisdiction, that's, that's all awesome. elevators in our jurisdiction. So before I go on, do, do are there any more questions? Yeah, no wait, Councilmember Jonah. What, um, what a gentleman. You know, that's great to hear. It sounds like it's sort of an open data thing. Um, is it, and I'll, I'll go back to the office and work on this, but is it information that is sort of downloadable and where you could analyze the information, or is it moment in time? Uh, quite honestly, I, I don't know. I'd have to go back and check and see how that data is, um, is, uh, is kept and stored and categorized, but I think we can probably do some work to isolate what it is you're looking for. Wait, to expound on her question, I know that NYCHA has a system where you can virtually actually go on and check the operation of a boiler in real time. Mm -hmm. So you can see on the screen that a boiler is working, not working, what's happening. Is it the same with the elevator system that you're saying? I don't think that's right, but again, I'll need to go back and, and take okay. a look because I'm not too familiar with it. Okay, because that would obviously be awesome if we could have that same type of virtual system that was connected that you could actually see the elevators operating, not operating in all developments. I'm pretty sure that does not exist, but again, let me uh, get, get familiar and I'll get back to the committee. Thank you, and similarly, for the calls in to NYCHA, given that they have their own complaint line, how does DOB get notified of that? So the call does not go into 311. In NYCHA, it goes to their own NYCHA complaint line. So what will happen is a in any case, when there's a serious complaint, we do get involved. And in some instances, if it's uh, an accident, even a minor one, uh, anybody gets injured or anything like that, um, we will be looped in and we will have to respond to those. I'm asking a different question. It's simply a matter of communication between the NYCHA complaint hotline and DOB. If it's a simple outage um, and 311 is not called, then maybe we will not be called. So simple outages can last hours and days, but DOB wouldn't know, uh, it sounds like. I would have to look into that, the, how the MOU is defined, but uh, we, we get notified by 311. And in, as I said, in serious incidents, um, NYCHA always informs us. Mm. Um, and wait, wait, so there seems to yeah. be, for the record, there seems to be maybe a gap. And the gap is if someone from NYCHA call, doesn't call 311 and calls their internal complaint system, um, it could inadvertently, not intentionally, leave out the input of DOB. And if that's true, then we should do something as a body to close that gap, is I think what, what the council member's alluding to. So again, not an indictment on DOB, but there seems to be in this line of questioning, we're all finding for the first time, perhaps, that there may actually be a gap in service, and if so, and you don't have to confirm or deny this, because I think we, we understand that there is a gap. Um, we should work together to close that gap so that citizens who are, in, who are residents of NYCHA receive the same service, whether they're calling 311 or their internal complaint system from DOB. Understood, and what we'll do on our end is, is work to better understand the, the extent of that gap to, one, to the extent one exists, and we'll of course follow up with the committee on that as well. Yep. Just for the record, I want to point out that this is this is what we anticipate would happen when you have a thorough hearing, that you'll find opportunities to better the service both between the council and whatever the administrative body is. 
And, and I think that's what we've uncovered today. This is actually how this is supposed to work. So just for everybody, this is not a gotcha. This is, this is what we're supposed to be able to do in open dialogue in a hearing setting is find opportunities to be better as a city and better as an agency and better in collaboration for the safety of residents. So. Last question, um, do you, are you familiar with the training for the elevator maintenance workers at NYCHA? I am not, Chanji, do you? I'm sorry? Are you familiar with the um, training requirements for elevator maintenance workers at NYCHA? Sorry, I don't know. So, it, so that's a very good question because if, they, if they're not subject to the same DOB training, Possibly, the, the the NYCHA elevator maintenance and or engineers that could be another potential gap, and and it could be an opportunity for standardization right. of those trainings, right? So even if the even if they're being trained on another track, okay. um, maybe there should be um, an opportunity to standardize that training so that potentially, you know, the the hundreds of thousands of of NYCHA residents aren't getting a less service because they're not trained in the same DOB way or with the same criteria. Un understood. Uh, what, what I can, and we'll of course follow up with to, to provide more information, but so the department licenses, agency directors and inspectors, there are licensed agency directors and inspectors who work within NYCHA. We also know that NYCHA does have its own in-house training program for the folks who are doing the work and the inspections, but again, we'll, we'll work to follow up with the committee. Thank you. Yeah. Council Member Jonah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this, these are really important topics that are being discussed today and have wide range impacts. Uh, but I, I don't want to make this about NYCHA, but I will go back to NYCHA for a moment. So, currently, a private owned property, if they're not performing their, first of all, is NYCHA required to have the same tests done uh, as any other residential building in New York City? the annual test, the three-year test, the five-year test, all those different tests, in, and monthly inspections by their own uh, service provider. So in terms of the inspections, it applies across the board, whether it's a NYCHA property uh, or uh, a non-NYCHA property. Um, monthly inspections, you, I'm not sure what you're... There is a required ma uh, maintenance agreement that's supposed to be done with an elevator company uh, on a monthly basis that elevator company is supposed to come out and evaluate the elevator. So as I mentioned, NYCHA has its own staff of elevator mechanics who are responsible for maintaining those elevators. But DOB oversees that staff. We oversee those we license and those licensees will have mechanics who report to the licensee. So is DOB aware if those inspections are being done monthly or not? I have to advise you that when you're in consultation, you should probably turn your mic off. So uh, it's it's fine. Um, so there is, uh, you can, perhaps you can yes. explain. Uh, so they, there is a requirement to uh, verify the fire service, that it's functional. Um, and the maintenance uh, personnel are also supposed to keep a maintenance log on site. And they are strict, uh, by the ASME code requirement, ASME code requirement, they're also supposed to follow the maintenance control program by the manufacturer of the elevators, which mm -hmm. they have to keep up with. And it, it, if it requires frequent um, inspections uh, more than annual, then they're supposed to do it. So when we go out and we check those logs, we make sure that those are being done. So are those logs being verified though by DOB? Only if it's a complaint and things like that, when we go out, we do check them, yes. So there is no oversight. It's only if there's a complaint that triggers you to in inspect and verify that those logs are being maintained. That is not different for NYCHA properties. For any property, I don't think we go out on every property and verify those logs. I mean, they're, they're required to keep them there. Uh, but uh, the annual and periodics do catch that if they're not being done. Mm -hmm. And those are reported back to us. Okay. So I just want to touch on a couple of proposed bills. Um, you're familiar with brownouts? That's when we don't have a blackout, but it's a brownout, right. half power. Yes. 
uh, most elevators operate on 220 electric and it triggers a safety. Okay. Um, this is nothing that a property owner can do to prevent. This is the flow of electricity that's provided by a third party. Um, has serious wear and tear on elevators and also uh, shuts them down. Brown out half phase, elevator will just shut in place uh, and anybody can be trapped. Some of the proposed bills are gonna have impacts. I'm gonna follow up with the question that'll leave both. We have experienced total blackout in New York City. How would you see a property owner, whether it be NYCHA or a privately owned property, could possibly anticipate a brownout or a blackout to be able to implement some of these regulations from helping those with disabilities to proper notice to, and, and we don't know the extent of a brownout or a blackout, the duration. How is this going to be managed, in your opinion? Well, I think I'll say what the bill requiring a reasonable accommodation plan the bill doesn't speak to the specifics of the plan, per se. It speaks to having a plan in place in the event of an outage and what they're going to be able to do to accommodate those folks who need the accommodation. But I believe intro 565 says um, elevators down more than 24 hours that, uh, should provide those that are disabled with accommodations can't prepare in advance for a brownout or a blackout, let's just use the worst case scenario, how would a property owner be able, and if it's citywide, first of all, the resources wouldn't be there for a third party provider to accommodate all of the disabled in the city of New York at the same time with the same needs. Yeah, I mean, I, he I hear what you're saying. In the event of a citywide blackout um, where everyone's facing the same challenges, that would certainly be a challenge. Not, my sense of things is that the bill was written more in, the, my, more in lines with the idea of an individual outage in that building and what, com what accommodations are going to be made for those folks in that building. And then also the understanding of the definition of disabled and we have various degrees of disabled and how does a property owner know that there's a disabled person living in an apartment versus visiting someone in an apartment? Uh, does, that, does this bill even look at the matter of visiting or, or visitors or those that are maybe say, staying overnight? Yeah, I could tell you that all good questions. The bill contemplates a role for the mayor's office of people with disabilities and presumably they'd be providing some sort of guidance that provides direction on what you're seeking. Okay. Uh, one of my uh, issues in my own experience is elevator replacement. The long period of time it actually takes to redo an elevator uh, and for various reasons, um, DOB is part of that problem because of the inspections that have to be done at phases and the notices for the inspections that have to be done. Um, and you're very familiar with this, I'm sure, the replacement of a new elevator and what it means that you can have an elevator down for six months, up to a year through no fault of the property owner, through no fault of the contractor, is just the way things happen. Can you elaborate more about why it takes six to 12 months to have an elevator rebuilt? So I wouldn't describe our role in the process as being part of the problem. I think it's an integral part of the process to ensure that the elevator or the modernization is performed appropriately and safely. Um, I think it's a little, outside the range to say six months to a year. Modernizations do unfortunately can take quite a bit of time. I think up to a year is, is, is excessive. Part of the reason why these modernizations can take certainly longer time than any of us would like is they often require new parts and new parts need to be fabricated outside of the city and it takes time to order those parts and install those parts. That sometimes is part of the reason why modernizations um, take longer than any of us would like. But I also understand there's a process by which, as the work is being done, there is inspections that are needed for the next phase, which also delays the project. We usually are called only at the end once the work has completed, and that's when we go out and verify that the elevator is safe 
for passenger use, and it can be returned back to service. So this is strong. Uh, this is solely on the shoulders of the contractors. Correct. The delay. Once there is no delay whatsoever due to inspection, sign-offs um, that delay the project. That is true. Once they have obtained their permits, they are free to work on the device. And once the work is completed, they will call us for an inspection. What's the time frame between the moment you get notified, on average, if you even already answer, to the moment an inspector comes out, evaluates the, how long does it take to evaluate the entire installation by DOB? The number of days that we respond to that uh, request for inspection or when we go out and do the actual oh. inspection? So the amount of time to request an inspection, the amount of time it takes to do a full inspection, the amount of time it takes to get a sign off to get the CFO to operate the elevator. Uh, so I think we are typically running the service level of about three days for inspection requests. Uh, that data is maintained on our website to inform our applicants what that uh, service level is. And uh, when we go out there, depending on scope of work, uh, typically for, I will give you an example, for a new installation, six-story building, which is uh, very typical, uh, it will take about four to five hours for our inspectors to completely verify that uh, all the safety features are working fully. And to, to highlight one of the things that Charanjit just said, we, we have a three-day service level on performing these inspections, and the service level is published on our website, right? So if you're, if you're installing this elevator, and you go on our website, and you see it's going to take three days for me to get my inspection, you should be requesting that inspection two or three days in advance to ensure that when I'm done, you know, our elevator people are showing up to perform the inspection. No, I, I believe that you can't order an inspection until you know that the work has been completed. Completed. And I think that's part of the provisions that under no circumstance you request an inspection until the work has been completed and to avoid an inspection being done and the work not being completed. So part of the reason why we've placed, we've made this information of our, on our service levels publicly available is to afford folks the opportunity to save as much time as possible. So they, this inspection can be requested in advance. Are there occasions when we show up and the work isn't completed? Absolutely, that's unfortunate. But this gives folks the opportunity to build in as little cushion as possible between the time in which their work is done to the time that the elevator is put back in service. But let's go back to that. Three days for an inspection, one day, four to five hours on average, right? Right. Then walk me through the next step. What happens? Then the inspector? Our inspector has verified that everything is uh, fully functional. Uh, on the spot, we give a certificate of compliance and the device can be put back in service. Okay. Then what is the contractor have to do to be able to, can he at that moment flip the switch? Yes. yes. At that very moment? Yes. Okay. And I would also like to point out that in case of single elevator buildings where we see a hardship, uh, we always expedite those uh, inspection requests. Okay. My next question is on uh, door locks. Are you concerned that there will, there will be enough supply for the actual equipment and the qualified labor to install these door locks by the end of the year. <clears throat> and for you to inspect that work, I would imagine, right? So uh, to your, uh, that's separate from these bills, but you're referring to the elevator door lock monitoring devices that are required. This was put into effect six years ago, and owners of buildings have had six years to comply. Um, for new construction, the law require that these d devices be put in immediately. Um, you know, as you had mentioned, um, it's coming into effect soon, and our ex expectation is that these devices will be in, in place. As we mentioned previously, there are periodic inspections that require the, these elevators. In the event the elevator does not have um, one of these monitoring devices, which cr you know, certainly are quite crucial and important for safety purposes, the department will be alerted of that deficiency, and they'll be given an opportunity to correct. Okay, without fine or penalty? If they fail to do so within that period of time, they will be issued an a violation, absolutely for which they've had six years to get these installed. Do you think our properties will be ready by the end of the year uh, and in compliance? I could tell you that you know, over the past six years, certainly a large number of them have had these devices installed, not just new construction, but for modernizations as well. So many buildings throughout the city, thankfully, now incorporate this important technology. Sitting here, I don't know to what extent currently there's a gap that exists but they have an obligation, they've had this obligation for six years to install these devices. 
and you haven't heard contrary uh, to them, the, the properties being ready, you haven't heard complaints from large groups. Oh, uh, we certainly have, yes. What were their complaints? Their complaint is that they, they, are, they don't have enough time to meet the deadline. Um, however, they've provided no evidence to support such a claim. And we have not heard from those who install these devices. Um, and these folks, um, the installers and trade associations and the like, they were part of the process um, that established this very important safety provision six years ago. Will NYCHA be ready? Uh, offhand, I don't know to what extent, I, I don't know. We can look into that and get back to it. We can check with NYCHA. Wouldn't that be a good gauge? Um, I would imagine that if NYCHA properties were ready by the end of the year uh, with this requirement, uh, that should be able to tell us that across the board all privately owned buildings should be ready as well. But if they're not, wouldn't that be the proof that you need that perhaps six years, although it's six years by the time the property owners were informed, by the time uh, the installations could be done, and by the time we can find those qualified to do the installations, wouldn't that be a clear indication? I'm not so sure it would be a clear indication, but we can certainly check in with NYCHA. I'd really like to hear, Chair, that would be a good follow-up. That would be a gauge for us to decide whether or not the end of the year is possible uh, to meet the deadline before we start penalizing. And in that event, if a NYCHA property is not compliant by the end of the year, do they receive a fine from DOB? Uh, they would re I'm pretty sure they would receive a violation, but there would be no monetary penalty associated with that violation, obviously. So basically, time to cure, no problem. We understand. We just put you on notice, and when you get around to it, get it done? I don't want to speak for NYCHA, but I'm pretty sure they recognize the, the, sort of the enormous value in having these door monitoring devices. Uh, so I, I'm pretty sure they're, they're working hard to comply if they haven't complied yet. But we don't know. Just for the record, one of the, here, one of the I don't work at NYCHA, so but I can, I'm happy to check with them. One, one of the things that we're trying to make sure that this committee has the capacity to do, which is to make sure that there are not two separate set of rules and regulations for um, general residential, um, privately owned buildings, and you know, and NYCHA. Right. So while this is not a NYCHA hearing, as we can see, there there are some inconsistencies potentially that we want to be able to reg to regulate a lot better so I understood so I, I understand and i don't want dob to get frustrated with this line of questioning as it relates to nitra this is just us realizing that there are some inconsistencies with the way the city is regulating its affordable housing units as opposed to uh, the privately owned units and that that can't be the case because it, what it does is it represents um, a, a perception that hundreds of thousands of residents are less, their safety is, is less valuable than, and, 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 and as a city, that's a narrative that, and as a chair, I, I can't have that be a narrative um, that I'm associated with. So um, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna go forward, but you know, we're gonna try to draw these parallels as often as we can in an effort to remedy them. Understood. So thank you for responding, and I understand it may be a little bit frustrating because you, this is not a NYCHA hearing, but these inconsistencies, um, as we find them and as they come up, uh, we're going to try to eradicate and remedy going forward. So, Thank you. Thank you, Chair. My last question, do any of these bills or codes have an impact on landmark buildings that would prevent them from fulfilling uh, their obligation to meet the standard. Is there, a, is there another set of approvals that are needed uh, when it comes to elevators uh, in landmark buildings? Is this specific to the door lock monitoring requirement? DLM, door, door lock monitoring that we were just discussing right now? In, in across the board, you have policies and procedures that are in place for elevators citywide. Right. When it's a landmark building, if there is a change that needs to be made or um, uh, door locks or any other provision for compliance, does it, do landmark building have a different issue? Does any of these requirements prevent a property owner from having the work done without or with or without landmark approval? 
So any safety requirements, any safety devices, those, um, there's no compromise. Uh, but those are, I don't think, affect that if the building is, or the, you know, if the elevator is in a landmark building or if it's not. Because this is uh, electromechanical equipment that is not usually within the site and adding these requirements or, or installing this type of equipment uh, doesn't affect them in, in any way and they, they have been complying fully. Uh, the only work that I can think of typically may be cab work uh, which is uh, not directly equated to any safety that I wouldn't think so and if they needed to do that they would have to get permission from the landmark uh, so I think there's a building here that, that calls for emergency lighting. Would that need landmark approval? Or the cab door? The emergency lighting and standby power requirements, um, they would be in a separate room where the generator would sit and the fuel storage would be. Um, so I'm not sure if that, that uh, I'm not sure either. That's why I'm asking the question. Landmarks And is furthermore, nearly all landmarks throughout the city are exterior, not interior landmarks. And all the work that these bills speak to, speak to inside the building. So there might be some challenges for landmark buildings just in this, due to like space constraints. But those, uh, those challenges are met by, you know, buildings that have the same situation that may not be landmarked. I believe there are elevators that fall subject to landmark protections based on their age and interiors in some properties do fall under landmark. It's just not exterior. Yeah, again, I didn't say all, nearly all. Certainly there are interior landmarks and there might be escalators or elevators that are, that are antiquated that are under landmarks jurisdiction and those very, very rare exceptions, there might be additional hurdles that would need to be overcome through the Landmarks Preservation Commission. But we're not aware of any of these rules or even any of the DOB rules have an impact on elevators that would create a contradict the landmark status. We're not aware. Nothing amongst this package that we see. Yeah. So nothing within this package, no. Are you aware of anything that impacts those properties that uh, certain types of modifications to a building might require approval from the Landmarks Preservation Commission, but that's separate and apart from elevators and talking about general construction work. Right. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, sorry, were you finished? Okay. This, the chair had to step away and ask me to fill in and... Um, Sorry, Councilmember Rivera, questions? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. It's just a quick question. Um, Assistant Commissioner, you've been with DOB for a while now, right? I'm not trying to date you, but you've been here for years. Four? years. Four? four? Yeah, a little before. In all that time, considering, I mean, I think in, it, it, it goes a little bit back to, to NYCHA, but in all that time, you know, considering that DOB has jurisdiction over the buildings, but not the 3,200 plus elevators, has there ever been a conversation in your tenure to revisit the MOU that exists between NYCHA and DOB? No. This, you know, that, that's the, the one thing that's incredibly frustrating. There's this MOU that exists between NYCHA and all these agencies, and, and we hold you to such incredible standards, and um, it's really difficult to, to figure out why we can't serve 400,000 families. But, um, okay, I just wanted to know whether or not that had ever been broached, and, and, I, and I appreciate your honesty. And that, that's it, that was my question, Madam Chair. Thank you, colleagues, any other questions? All right, thank you. If I could just continue a little bit. Um, I wanna ask you about 788A. Um, you could let me know your thoughts. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you have a question? Oh, my, oh, my apologies. I'm <laughs> if you could expound a bit on your concerns with 788A. 
Certainly. So I, I think as we understand the intent of the bill, uh, certainly based on the introduction that the chair provided, um, we would agree that there, there needs to be more oversight over mechanics, those folks who are performing the actual work on the elevator. Um, and as such, we're advancing legislation with the state to do a number of things, including requiring specific qualifications for mechanics along with a license. Um, this bill, intro 788A, uh, we, does not pr provide a license for mechanics. It creates a new license for or businesses that do a number of things, including maintenance work, who mechanics work for. And that creates this buffer um, between the department and its oversight and the actual folks performing the work. So while we, we appreciate the intent of what this bill seeks to accomplish, we think a more direct way to get at this issue is to focus specifically on the mechanics who are doing the work. And so where are you in your negotiations with the state? What's the likelihood of that bill going through I, and I, timing? There's been talk about doing this for quite some time, um, several sessions now. I'd say from my perspective, I think the chances are, are very good um, that we'll see something happening during the session, and that's our hope. And that ends in June? Correct. And would passage of this bill get in the way of what you're looking for at the state level, or is your concern it would be duplicative, or could it be woven in together? Um, it has the potential perhaps to be woven. Certainly I think what happens at the state would sort of preempt what it is we're trying to do here. And if for a number of reasons included just sort of simplicity's sake, focusing on a single track would be, would be beneficial. And what we've shared with the state and what we're hopeful that they're going to be agreed to seeks to accomplish appropriate oversight for, for mechanics technicians. So if the state session ends and your bill has not moved through, would you be more interested in 788A as a fallback? Yeah, I mean, obviously we're happy to continue having conversations with the committee and the sponsor about um, what it is they're, they're seeking to do as it relates to additional oversight for uh, mechanics. Happy to have that conversation, of Great, course. Great, thank you. Lastly, I just want to ask you about an intro um, that is pre-considered. Um, that has to do with the definition of site safety training full compliance, uh, the date and the um, site safety training second compliance date. Um, do, uh, do you support the extending the deadline for site safety training uh, for the full compliance date and the second compliance date? So the bill seeks to extend that second date uh, by six months um, from uh, June to December of this year, and the department has no objection with, with the legislation. Okay, do you have any other concerns with this bill? Um, you know, I think broadly speaking, obviously this is extremely important. Um, the department has been working very hard trying to implement this legislation, and you know, in every forum that we have publicly, we take the opportunity to stress that the need to get this training, comprehensive, effective safety training, and to get it as soon as possible. Can I just ask you, as a reminder, it's Small Business Services that's responsible for have, keeping the list of the training trainors, or is that, do you have a role in that? That's the buildings department. So the way the law works, and all right. of our training, no problem, all, and all, the, all of our training works, you have to be an approved course provider by the buildings department. So the buildings department's responsible for approving those who are qualified to provide this training, and we maintain a list that's publicly available of who is qualified to provide this training. So just as something that's of particular interest to me, do you know if any of those um, trainers are worker cooperative model? We have 58 uh, approved course providers who are, who are providing site safety training offhand. I don't know um, to the extent any of them fit that model, but I'm happy to take a look and follow up. Thank you, I appreciate it. Hang on one second. Do you have any concerns about intro 1508? Um, so we're planning on requiring this for new construction. 
okay, as it relates to existing construction. Um, similar to the other bill that requires standby and backup power in existing buildings, um, we certainly get the intent and the importance of the intent to you know, save money and improve sustainability, but it's something we need to sort of um, talk more about with our code committees to better understand what challenges, if any, are associated with existing buildings. Sounds like we have a plan. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Thank you for coming by and answering our questions. We do have a number of follow-up uh, questions that we hope you'll get back to the committee on as quickly as possible. Certainly, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone? Thank you. Okay, next we're gonna hear from um, Donald Ranchdy. Apologies for butchering your name. Um, Nadia Marin Malma and Sean uh, Bennington, I think. And um, please have a seat. Please give a copy of your testimony to the Sergeant in Arms who will uh, share that with us. And uh, anyone, whoever sits down first, can start. And just uh, state your name and your, uh, the organization you represent for the record. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my name is Donald Ranchty. I'm Senior Vice President for the Building Trades Employers Association, a 116-year-old trade, trade organization that represents 26 contractor associations and 1,200 contractor companies in New York City, doing $50 billion worth of business in New York. Um, in the interest of making sure that the most important parts of my testimony this morning are up front, I want to cut to the chase and I'll bring you in on some background second. <clears throat> this bill is not about delaying construction worker safety training. We are all still in agreement that the need for more enhanced training is necessary. This bill is about accurately assessing the scope and magnitude of what we optimistically set out to do with Local Law 196 back in 2017. When we were working on the drafting of the legislation, everyone involved was acutely aware of the need for safety training, but less aware of the fact that we were asking 120,000 construction workers to find a 30-hour training class, or in some cases, 62 hours of safety training that was acceptable under the law, fit into a work-life schedule, evenings and weekends for most workers, needed to be paid for, ultimately needed to be certified, that it met all of the training requirements that were set forth in Local Law 196. On the professional training industry side of the equation, classes needed to be quickly ramped up, more seats were needed, increased training capacity, courses and training hour curriculum needed to be submitted to the DOB for approval. All of this amounted, uh, amounted to a logistical nightmare for a project of this scale. On the regulatory side, there were implementing details that needed to be ironed out as well. The devil is always in the details. The legislation left many open questions which needed to be uh, implemented through rules by DOB. Um, not, we're not pointing any fingers, but um, some of the questions were, what would the LSST cards look like? Which portions of the 100-hour training program that were spelled out in the bill would be applicable? And what is, uh, in what cases would supervisor or competent person need the 62 hour training and not the 30 hours of training? <clears throat> Some of these are still need to be answered. We were up against a hard deadline written into the legislation and the clock was ticking. For our part, um, we surveyed a, a number of our largest contractors this past March, 212 to be exact. We found that on average, nearly 65% of our union workforce had undergone, undergone the training. In no way is this foot dragging, as some would like to, to accuse us of. This means that 78,000 workers had actually undergone the required training. There's no procrastination there. On the flip side, it also meant that 42,000 workers still required the necessary training with only two months to do so. This isn't a time to point fingers and it should be about assisting an entire industry to accomplish a very worthwhile goal. There remains to be an opportunity to raise the bar for safety and construction work in New York City, and let's take that step in that direction together and make sure that all of our workers get trained appropriately and not rush to do so inadequately. Thank you.
Thank you, and we'll continue. But can I just ask you a really quick question? Of course. Do you think that, um, what do you think the reasons are for the, I forget your number, 40 some thousand workers who did not get training? Do you think it's because of lack of access to trainers or, or you know, waiting lists? Or what I do you think it was? Simply, I would say it's a combination of many different factors. Um, there was a need to increase capacity on the training side, and that couldn't be done quickly. It just it worked out where more classes needed to be added, more seats, more training. Um, many of the course providers that the assistant commissioner mentioned earlier that are approved by DOB were not um, in early stages approved to teach some of the courses, and that needed to be done. Whether or not they had to um, put together a curriculum and submit that to DOB, and DOB then had to approve, all of that takes time. On, um, and, and we're not without blame as well. Uh, of course, there's always uh, some built-in procrastination in human nature. Um, everyone says, oh, I have 12 months to do this, or six months, or two months, whatever the case may be. Um, but also, we, what we didn't understand was we were asking workers to take time away from work, unpaid, or fit this into a schedule where you have to go in the evenings, you have to go on weekends, um, you know, not everyone has the ability to do that. So uh, there's no finger pointing here. What we're saying is there, it was a, it was an. I'm not asking right. about, don't, I'm not implying anything. <clears throat> do you think there's uh, enough capacity now to meet the demand? If we extend the deadline until December, then yes. Thank you very much. Please. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, my name is Sean Brennan. I'm the training director with the Mason Tenders Training Fund. I'm also the uh, uh, chairman of the Building and Construction Trades Council Health and Safety Committee, as well as an appointee to the Site Safety Training Task Force. Uh, I want to apologize before I even begin uh, the, in my haste this morning to put together my, my prepared remarks for your review. Uh, my new copy machine decided to copy two pages of the front page and not the second page, so if you'd like, I'll happily get it to you electronically later. Please, exactly. We'll make sure you have an email address so you can submit Great, it for thank the record. You. Thank you. I can speak extemporaneously, though, on what I think are the two most important points. You asked uh, Donald, um, uh, what's the reason? And again, not to point fingers, but, but so that everyone understands. When the, the law was passed and um, went into effect on March 1st, prior to March 1st, there was an approval process for those 58 approved training providers to be able to uh, deliver the coursework um, on any given city course. We would, the city would, would develop requirements for those courses and we as responsible training providers would follow those requirements. We simply check the box that says, yes, this is how we'll do it. And the city would then randomly and on occasion audit those classes to make sure that we were, we were doing the right thing. And it worked. With the advent of this bill, however, or th this law, they changed their approval process. And with all the best of intentions, and we applauded it actually, because they wanted to make sure that the training that was being provided was good quality training. The process became so onerous, so burdensome, so time consuming, that it was taking months and months for approvals to come through. To the point where at a task force meeting in September, there were no approved training providers. In fact, the first approved training provider was our training fund, and that was October 23rd of last year. So now we're in a constraint. Already we know we can't get it done by December 1st. We pushed the date back. Thankfully, and, and to their credit, the department has decided to revert back to the old way of, of uh, approving and, and monitoring training. So now we're able to do what we need to do. Uh, just to give you an idea of how, how much training can get done in a short period of time, we at the Mason Tenders have been able to train over a thousand people in just one course over the last, uh, since March 1st. So th the capacity really is there, we just need the time to get all the people in that need the training in. Uh, we've, we've noticed there's a tremendous response since we've been able to offer the courses. 
the other issue is a, um, a, a non-definition within the law. There are five roles that require supervisory training. The construction superintendent, the top dog on the job. The site safety manager, the top safety person on the job, the site safety coordinator, and the construction safety manager, or the, uh, I'm sorry, the concrete safety manager. These are all the top echelon uh, uh, people uh, on any construction site. And then there is this kind of a vague term, competent person. The competent person isn't a job, it's not a title, it's an assignment, it's a designation. And it there are several designations within the code that require a competent person, 16 different places in fact. That's caused uh, such confusion with the contractor base and with the workforce because nobody knows who needs to have the supervisory training, who can be the competent person. Any worker at any given time can be assigned as the competent person and therefore they feel they need this training. If, the, if the, the definition of the competent person isn't narrowed and we would recommend that you narrow it to uh, the, the requirements within Local Law 81 of 2017 where the superintendent assigns one competent person per job site that they're responsible for. That would certainly reduce the number of people that need that supervisory training. Without doing that, I, I, I don't agree that we have the capacity to get all the supervisors done, even by December 1st. Got it, but if we were to do as you suggest, do mm -hmm. you think the suggested timetable is a good one? Yes. Thank you very much, appreciate it, thank you. Um, good morning. My name is Nadia Marin Molina. I'm testifying on behalf of Endelon, which is the National Day Labor Organizing Network. Um, and I'm bringing together some of the concerns uh, from our organization, but also from some of our member organizations, which include NICE, New Immigrant Community Empowerment, uh, Workers Justice Project, La Colmena, and also Catholic Charities um, in the Bronx and New York Committee for Occupational Safety and Health, NICOSH which have all worked on training day laborers um, and have actually, and actually are participants in the uh, site, site safety training under SBS, which you had asked the question about. So I'm, I'm, the details are, are in, our, in our written um, testimony, but I'm gonna skim through a series um, of problems that we see in the implementation um, of this training requirement and then some of our proposed solutions. Um, it's a lot, <laughs> but we see a lot of problems in that there have been specific to low wage, uh, mostly immigrant workers, day laborers and uh, construction workers. So the, f the first is that day laborers and other construction workers right now are being fired by their employers in advance of the, the deadline. So um, as the, the training deadlines have come up, um, workers are hearing from their employers either get the training um, yourself, figure out how you get it, or don't come back. Um, and that happens whether, you know, even if the deadline has not yet come, right, June 1st for the 30 hours, employers are starting to make those requirements or subcontractors are hearing it from their general contractors and so they're imposing it. So as this, um, as these deadlines come forward, workers are already getting fired um, in advance. Some employers are illegally buying cards so that the workers will have the cards, but the, they don't get training. Um, so they're just getting cards so that there will be some uh, semblance of compliance with the legislation. So instead of creating a climate of safety on the job, it's creating a climate of fear um, for workers who are not able to access enough trainings yet. Um, meanwhile, the site safety pro training program hasn't even started. So the city council created a $5 million pool to train day laborers specifically SBS selected, um, you know, went through a process, selected uh, organizations in each area to do the trainings, but there have been no contracts finalized, no funding has been provided at all, and the current target start date is June 1st, which is the same as the current, you know, deadline. Um, the, and, and worse, the organizations have trainers who are capable of doing OSHA 30 trainings um, and have had them ready since before you know, any of this happened, but we're not allowed to do those trainings under this grant um, because uh, SBS was creating 
online trainings, um, which they thought would be done more quickly than they are, and so there's been delays because of that. Um, the organizations are sort of working with them on that, but meanwhile, they could have been doing OSHA trainings for months um, that they have not been able to do. In addition, the restrictions on site safety training providers mean that outside of OSHA 10 and OSHA 30 trainings, there are other trainings, right? Um, and that Department of Buildings has very strict um, restrictions on who is able to offer those trainings. None of the organizations are allowed to give anything other than OSHA 10 and OSHA 30 trainings. And this means an organization, for example, like NICOSH, which has been doing training for you know, 40 years, cannot get, um, cannot, cannot give these, these trainings, much less the other organizations, which are also very experienced in trainings with day laborers. Um, and the list, in case you want to see it, is that I put the link um, in the testimony, but right now there are unions, there are colleges, there are for-profit training schools basically on those 58 providers, but there's no nonprofit organizations, um, or much less worker centers that are able to do those trainings. So, um, and then the last thing is the task force. We, um, Ligia Walpa from Workers Justice Project is a daily, from a day labor organization, is on the site safety task force, but they don't seem to have the authority to really oversee the implementation. So um, the experience there has been that these concerns have been brought up in the task force meetings um, by multiple stakeholders. Um, all of these different concerns have been brought up and the way that the task force is being treated is like sort of like an information session, like here's the information, this is the update. Um, and then when there are concerns about workers being fired, the argument is DOB's mission is, you know, that goes beyond the scope of the task force, it goes beyond the scope of our work, there's nothing that we can do. And so we're telling you this as organizations that have worked closely and tried to use the channels that exist, which is why we're bringing these concerns here and now. Um, the proposed solutions that we have First would be to mandate clearly that employers are the ones who should be required to provide trainings for these workers, rather than having the burden go to, uh, to the workers themselves, um, so that they're not you know, requiring the workers to go out and buy the cards or to get the training on their own or firing them, much less. Mandating uh, cultural competency training for Department of Building staff and site safety inspectors focused on working with vulnerable communities like day laborers providing access, like I said, for nonprofit um, centers to be able to do um, these trainings, some sort of alternative, obviously you want certification of some kind, but there should be some alternative uh, path to do it. Um, allow SBS to advance 100% of the funds so that the training can get off the ground immediately, even though obviously it's been delayed. Create an additional oversight body that is specific to the concerns of the, you know, the vulnerable population, which is the, the entire reason that the legislation was created, um, right? Day laborers and immigrant workers, it could be an interagency body that would look at those concerns and, and help um, in the implementation process. Increased transparency, the task force meetings have been held regularly, but we don't have minutes from those meetings. I don't imagine that you all have received minutes from the task force meetings, so there's no way for you or for the public to know what the concerns have been and how they've been raised all along. Um, and then detailed data of the enforcement activities, which is already required within the, within the legislation. And then last but not least is the implementation deadlines. While obviously it's good to, you know, we support the, an extension, but our, our opinion is that it should be at least 12 months and that there needs to be some kind of evaluation process to see how it's really working and how it's working with this particular group of workers. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, I see that representatives from the Department of Buildings are here. I'm sure they're, they've got your recommendations and they'll take them back and consider doing some of the things without the requirement of legislation like cultural competency, you know, just making sure that I'm getting some nods, for the record. I'm getting some nods, making sure that, um, you know, there are multiple languages that are spoken and trainings are given in multiple languages. Thank you for these suggestions. I, am, I have recommended to the City Council staff that they meet with you and, you know, follow up on some of these, on your ideas. 
it's incredibly important that you are here today to represent them. We really appreciate your testimony. Thank you very much. And thanks to everyone who came today. We learned a lot. I'm gonna call up the next panel. Okay, we'd like to hear from um, Margarita Arana, um, Lydia Gual Gualpa, again, apologies for butchering your name, and Char Charlie Arush Arushima. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Feel free to start. Buenos días, Honorable Robert Connery, Chair y distinguidos miembros del Comité de Vivienda y Edificios de la Ciudad de Nueva York. Mi nombre es Margarita Arana, soy una madre de una pequeña niña de un año que se llama Zoe. Soy trabajadora de la construcción y miembro del Proyecto de Justicia Laboral. Um, good morning, Honorable Robert Carnegie and distinguished members of the Housing and Building Committee of the city. My name is Margarita Arana. I am the mother of a one-year-old girl named Zoe. I'm a construction worker and member of the Workers' Justice Project. Este día estoy aquí con mucho dolor, tristeza y también con rabia, porque esta semana dos familias más perdieron un padre y un hijo. Esta semana el señor Nelson Salinas y el joven Eric Mendoza fueron asesinados por contratistas irresponsables que le ponen precio a nuestra vida y a nuestra salud. ¿Cuántos trabajadores más tienen que morir para que esta ciudad tome acción contra estas compañías criminales? ¿Cuántos trabajadores más tienen que morir para hacer que los contratistas se hagan responsables no solo de pagarnos el entrenamiento de salud y seguridad, pero también de ofrecernos un lugar libre de peligros? ¿Hasta cuándo vamos a dejar que estas compañías criminales sigan construyendo en esta ciudad? Y asesinando a más trabajadores. I'm here today with so much pain, sadness, and also with anger because this week two families have lost a father and a son. This week, Mr. Nelson Salinas and the young Eric Mendoza were murdered by irresponsible contractors who put a price on their lives and their health. How many more workers have to die before New York City can take action against these criminal contractors? How many more workers have to die before making contractors responsible for training workers? on health and safety training and making them responsible for a safe workplace. For how long more are we going to let these criminal contractors continue to build in our city and continue to kill more workers? Estoy aquí porque tengo entendido que hay una propuesta de, exister, de extender la fecha límite de la implementación de la segunda fase de la ley 196 que requiere que los trabajadores tengan 30 horas de salud y seguridad en junio primero del 2019. El problema real que enfrentamos nosotros y nosotras los trabajadores de la construcción no solo es la falta de acceso a entrenamiento de salud y seguridad, pero también enfrentamos discriminación, largas horas de trabajo con salarios bajos y miedo a quedarnos sin un trabajo al reclamar nuestros derechos a tener un lugar de trabajo seguro y sin peligro. I understand that today you'll be proposing to extend the deadline for the second implementation phase of Local Law 196, which requires workers to have 30 hours of training on health and safety by June 1st, 2019. However, it is important for you all to know that the problem is not only the limited access to the health and safety trainings, but there are other issues such as discrimination, long hours of work with low wages, and fear of losing the job when we speak up for the right to have a safe workplace. Esta nueva ley ha generado muchísima confusión, preocupación, desinformación y también miedo. Agradezco mucho su apoyo porque mi organización, Proyecto de Justicia Laboral, haya podido entrenar a 805 jornaleros de forma gratuita, incluyéndome a mí, en los últimos nueve meses, pero todavía hay miles de trabajadores que aún no tienen este entrenamiento. Muchos están siendo despedidos de sus trabajos. En ocasiones, sus patrones se aprovechan tratando de conseguir un entrenamiento y proveer a un precio muy alto a sus empleados con el fin de descontarles de su sueldo. En ocasiones, el patrón ni siquiera les da el entrenamiento, solo les consigue su tarjeta. Uh, the law has generated a lot of confusion, concern, misinformation, and fear. I'm very grateful for your support so that my organization, Worker Justice Project, could train 805 day laborers, including myself, 
in Neosha 30 construction in the, the past nine months, but there are still thousands of workers who do not have this training yet. Many are being dismissed from their jobs. Sometimes their employers take advantage, asking them to work and pay for their own training, which results in employers deducting the costs of the training from the worker salaries. Ante esta situación, hay muchísimo más fraude con la tarjeta falsa y también muchos están trabajando con el miedo de que un inspector pueda llegar a su lugar de trabajo y hacer que sean despedidos por no tener su OSHA 30. La preocupación se ha vuelto una odisea y el miedo es real. En mi organización, Proyecto Justicia Laboral, todos los días hay llamadas y mensajes de texto de trabajadores que necesitan y quieren tomar el entrenamiento de OSHA 30 de manera gratuita. Tenemos una lista de 800 trabajadores que están en la espera y cada día 60 personas se inscriben para tomar las clases, pero ante la falta de fondos y recursos, las clases son limitadas y no podemos con todas las solicitudes del día a día. Es por eso que quiero pedir más tiempo y fondos para que estas personas puedan hacer su entrenamiento sin correr ante el reloj. Así pueden obtener su entrenamiento y sepan de los peligros a los que están expuestos que sepan que se merecen condiciones dignas y seguras en su lugar de trabajo y que sepan que tienen el derecho a que se les provea el equipo de protección necesario para cuidar de su vida y de su salud. Um, in this situation, there is much more fraud with false cards and also many are working in fear that an inspector can arrive at their workplace and that they're going to be fired because they don't have an OSHA 30. Uh, the worry has become an odyssey and the fear is real. In my organization, Worker Justice Project, every day there are calls and text messages from workers who need to take the OSHA 30 training free. We have a list of 800 workers who are on a waiting list, and every day 60 people um, sign up for more classes. But since there's a lack of funds uh, and resources, the classes are limited, and we can't um, with, all the, with all the applications day to day. This is why we want to ask for more time and funds so that people are able to do their training um, without running against the clock, they're able to obtain their training and that they'll be able to learn about the dangers to which they're exposed, that they deserve dignified conditions uh, and safe conditions in the workplace and that they have the right to have their uh, protective equipment that's necessary to take care of their lives and their health. Ya es hora de decir ni una muerte más. Ya es hora de criminalizar a estos contratistas irresponsables. También ya es hora de hacer que los contratistas se hagan responsables de proveernos los entrenamientos de salud y seguridad. El domingo 28 de abril a las 3 de la tarde, más de 100 trabajadores estaremos tomando las calles de Brooklyn en Sunset Park para recordar a los que han muerto, recordar, reclamar justicia y seguir luchando por más trabajos seguros. It is time to say not, not one more death. It is time to criminalize these irresponsible contractors. And it is also time to make these contractors responsible for providing us the trainings in health and safety that they should. On April 28th at 3 p.m., more than 100 workers will be taking the streets of Brooklyn in Sunset Park to remember those who have died, um, reclaim justice, and keep fighting for safer jobs. Esperamos contar con ustedes para hacer que no haya ni una muerte más y que sigan apoyando y consideren los centros de jornaleros como parte de sus prioridades de negociación y presupuestaria de este año. Esperamos seguir trabajando estrechamente con ustedes. Muchas gracias. We hope to count on you to ensure there is not one more death in the construction industry and that you continue to support day labor centers as part of your priorities during this year's budget process. We look forward to continuing to work closely with you. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. So um, thank you so much for um, allowing me to speak. Um, and um, so I'm here on behalf of Worker Justice Project, um, obviously to talk um, in regards to the construction safety law 196. Um, WJP is a uh, worker justice project. It's a Brooklyn based uh, workers rights organize, um, organization that addresses the racial and economic injustice that day laborers and their families um, face by building collective power and creating solutions to the problems our members experience at work in communities where they live. Um, so. Uh, on behalf of Worker Justice, obviously I'm here to support the extension of um, the deadline of Local Law 196. Ideally, we, will, we would want to see a one-year extension, not six months. Um, 
uh, to address um, the implementation and enforcement challenges of local law 196. I also currently serve on the size safety task force that was created under local law 196. And I actually find it extremely problematic, the implementation process um, uh, that it's currently undergoing at the moment. Um, and the concerns come from one, um, um, you know, I appreciate so much um, the work that DOB is doing, but my concern is that the, this local law that is aimed to protect workers' rights and workers' safety is given to an agency who's not chartered to do that. And that's problematic. Um, and, 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 I, and I have seen some of the challenges has been a lot about failing to develop effective outreach to workers and employers in advance deadlines, and I think has a lot to do with the lack of understanding of what that workforce really looks like. Um, I think the other one is um, ex um, there needs to be a real understanding of the situation that day laborers and immigrant construction workers are currently facing in that industry. There is about 30,000 or probably more that um, do not have access to OSHA 30 trainings or any type of trainings. Um, and there is tons of workers who have, are being retaliated for potentially being fired from their workplaces because do not have access to OSHA 30s. And the concern really is here. Um, so, the, so we need a better, a stronger bill. This is what this is about. Um, local law 196, actually there has no clear language that holds employers account responsible for providing and paying 40 hours of health and safety training. Um, and that's an issue. Um, and the reason I'm, I'm saying that this is an issue, it's because the employer is putting all the training and health and safety responsibility on community organizations, on the public, um, and on the worker. While at the same time, who's ripping off the profits of, safe, of having a, 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 a trained workforce is actually employers, corporations who are profiting out of New York City, who's making billions of dollars, but at the same time, it's putting price on the lives of workers. So our recommendations are the following, that um, the law, um, the recommendations is that the law should mandate actually employers to provide and actually pay for this training. We mandate that the Department of um, Building, the senior staff and science safety inspectors undergo 40 hours of cultural competency trainings. Uh, we really wanna make sure that the inspectors are interacting with uh, workers are one, really understand, are educating workers and not creating more fear than what already is happening in the industry. And obviously the other challenge is we are, the reason we're requesting one year extension, it's because the promise of that $5 million that was promised to make sure that there is equal opportunity access, it's been a year and the funds have not been released yet. Um, so we have, WJP has a list of 800 people, as um, it said, that are waiting to be trained, but we cannot do that because there is no lack of funds. Um, uh, so we, um, I'm gonna cut off there because I know um, Nikos and Andelon is gonna continue to highlight the issue, but I just wanna highlight again that this is becoming extremely, uh, extreme concern for like, not only worker centers, for workers themselves, who are potentially a threat of being fired from the, the, their workplaces, um, who are anxious and desperate because do not have and do not know where to take those OSHA 30 trainings. And at the end of the day, who's benefiting and who are ripping off uh, workers are contractors and the private training um, industries who are charging over $500 just to access these trainings. So, we hope to count with your support, not only to add the extension, but to actually amend local law so we hold responsible, specifically employers and contractors, to actually for them to provide and pay for these trainings. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, my name is Charlie Uruchima uh, from the New York, Committee for, New York Committee for Occupational Safety and Health. I am gonna be reading a prepared statement uh, written uh, by our Executive Director Charlene Obernauer and myself, Charlie Uruchima. The New York Committee for Occupational Safety and Health supports the extension of the deadline for Local Law 196 due to issues in the law's implementation. NICOSH is an independent nonprofit health and safety organization with offices in New York City and Hopwash, Long Island. 
approximately 175 local unions and other labor and community-based organizations in a metropolitan area are members of NICOSH, as well as several hundred individual workplace safety and health activists, healthcare and legal professionals, and concerned New Yorkers. NICOSH has been providing technical assistance and comprehensive training in environmental and occupational safety and health for, to unions, employers, government agencies, and community-based organizations for nearly four decades. NICOCH is an expert on construction safety and health, trains 7,000 construction workers annually, and coordinates the Manhattan Justice for Workers Collaborative, which increases reporting of wage and hour violations and health and safety violations among day laborers in New York City. NICOCH authors an annual report on construction fatalities, Deputy Skyline, which has been cited by numerous publications, including the New York Times. Local Law 196 was created to protect the lives of construction workers in New York City, and it's a significant, and it's a significant step, fo step forward for New York City. NICOSH was and continues to be an avid supporter of construction safety training and Local Law 196, as training has proven time and time again to save workers' lives. However, if this law is not properly implemented, it threatens to do more harm than good for vulnerable workers, particularly undocumented immigrants. There have been significant delays from the New York City Department of Buildings on the, law, on the law's implementation, which has prevented providers from getting their curricula approved and providing training. Deadlines have been extended with little to no outreach to workers. And mass confusion permeates the masses. Whether union or non-union workers, whether union or non-union workers, workers do not know what training they need to take and by what date. New York City's construction workers are confused and frustrated and they do not know what training will be required for them to work. And this confusion is, is exacerb exacerbated when workers are already vulnerable, such as, such as immigrant workers. Further, low, rate, low road em employers are taking advantage of this confusion to exploit immigrant workers, as has been mentioned by the Workers' Justice Project and National Daily Labor Organizing Network. NICOCH's Manhattan Justice for Workers Collaborative has had cases of employers threatening to fire workers for not having for not having 30 hours of training, employers selling workers illegal, fake, and real but unearned cards directly to workers without providing trainings, and workers being targeted by fake trainers and being provided with fake cards. Workers are desperate to work and have little options other than to be placed on a two-month waiting list at their local worker center, like WJP, or pay an exorbitant amount of money to receive trainings which is often not possible for low-wage workers. Workers who have, who have trouble accessing trainings are often, immigrants, are often immigrants, two of whom have died in the construction this past week alone, like Nelson Salinas and Eric Mendoza. This is an outrage. How is the New York City Council going to act to protect these workers who are being retaliated against? How is the New York City Council going to go after these bad employers who are giving out fake cards? These are questions that need to be answered and fast because workers are paying the price for this fumbled rollout. Finally, the root of this issue is the health and safety of our workers in our city. New York City Council needs to make sure trainings are accessible or the black market will only grow and workers will continue to die because of lack of training. We support Local Law 186 and have always supported trainings for workers because we know that trainings save lives. However, the implementation of this law has been truly disappointing. We need to do better. The next implementation phase, June 1st, 2019, is rapidly approaching and New York City's workers are not ready. We need to extend this date, we would recommend at least by one year, in order to meet the need for workers. Further, we need to extend deadline, the deadline for the implementation of the full 40 hours of training by a similar amount of time. Thank you all for your time and consideration of our comments and for working to create safer and healthier jobs in New York City. Thank you so much. I, I'm just looking up. There is a program. I know I'm not supposed to do this, but there is a program that's uh, done in Spanish at the Murphy Institute. Um, that's a OSHA 10 training program um, that they do every month. And then there's another program um, that I can get you the information on that does training in Spanish. Thank you so much for testifying. Really appreciate your coming here. We're taking all this very seriously. And there's one more panel. So thank you very much. Thank you for coming. We heard everything. Thank you.
appreciate you. The last panel, we have um, James Duffy, Robert Martin, Michael DiMattia, and Zach Steinberg. Can I ask you to pause for one minute? Thank you. You guys were Rebney. Rebney. Okay, you know, East Hand. you guys with? Okay, I'm with ECN and I see. You guys are too dressed up for me. I don't know if I'm the right <laughs> company. <laughs> I'm not Helen Rosenthal. <laughs> I uh, am City Council Member Keith Powers, and uh, I think I think I'm filling in here. So, thank you everybody for being here today. Uh, do we want to go ahead? Yeah, we have you for this. Yeah, okay. Here. Great. We're good. Why don't we begin? Why don't we start? Do you start? Start on my left. But yeah, right. Yes. Can you can you just identify yourself? Elevator Industries Association. All right, go ahead. All right, so I wanted to thank um, uh, the members of the committee for the opportunity to testify this morning. Um, the Elevator Industries Association represents contractors that maintain, repair, and modernize elevators and escalators in residential and commercial buildings throughout the city of New York. All of the elevator, all the uh, EIA contractors are parties to a collective bargaining agreement with the elevator division of Local 3 IBW. We are here today in support of the Bill 788A. This bill will, one, update the requirements for elevator company and director licenses in New York City, and two, it will establish new safety training requirements for all new and existing elevator employees. These new requirements will mandate initial and continued safety training, which will keep all workers up to date on the best industry safety practices and the latest technology. 
We thank Council Member Richie Torres for sponsoring this important legislation. Responsible employees such as our members already provide some safety training. For example, the Elevated Industries Association contractors under the terms of the Local 3 Collective Bargain Agreement already provide annual OSHA training to their employees. Unfortunately, there are many companies that are not as proactive about safety as the Elevator Industries uh, Association contractors. Many of these co companies provide just a bare minimum of safety training, or worse yet, none at all. This bill will use the industry's best practices to establish required safety training standards for the New York City elevator industry. The new safety training will apply to existing and new employees alike. While industry veterans may be skilled in repairing and modernizing elevators, some can become complacent about always working in a way that ensures safety for workers and the writing public. As to new employees, the bill will mandate that regardless of skill level or formal training, or whether they work for a small or large company, all employees will have meaningful instruction about how to perform their work safely. This bill, for the first time, requires that all employees will be, be provided with 36 hours of initial training. The mandate will include training on safe work practices concerning the use of jumpers, fall protection, electric safety, lockout and tagout procedures, and product-specific safety applications. Tr it will also provide training on New York City-specific codes, rules, commissioners, orders, bulletins, and it will also provide training regarding new technology in the elevator industry. In addition to that initial training, every three years, in order to remain qualified, each employee must complete at least seven hours of continuing education. The Elevated Industries Association believes the provisions of this bill can be quickly implemented by the Department of Buildings with little or no additional cost. Likewise, these requirements will not be burdensome for responsible employers. For example, all Elevated Industries Association contractors already keep track of existing employee safety training requirements under their existing contract with Local 3 and regularly report various degrees of information uh, to, the DB, to the DOB already. In addition, there has been some questions about the use of the term supervision in connection with elevator work regulated by this bill. In our view, the term supervision should have the same working meaning as that term has been used in other New York City construction laws. In other words, the licensed companies are responsible for their employees who work under the company's general direction. We believe that interpretation of the term supervision that would require a supervisor to be on the premises to direct the work on every elevator that is being maintained, repaired, or modernized is, to put it mildly, unworkable. The ongoing training mandate provided by this bill will keep both those who work and those who ride elevators safe and secure. We appreciate the city's council's willingness to hold a hearing on this bill and look forward to continuing to work with the sponsor, Council Member Torres, Chair Carnegie, and other members of the council to see this bill passed. In regards to the other bills on today's agenda, we support intro 786 that would require the DOB to report on the efficacy of elevator brake monitors and remote elevator monitoring systems. In regard to intro 787, we fully support the goal of ensuring that the brake monitors and elevator monitoring systems are maintained annually. However, the council should be aware that many of these systems operate on proprietary software owned by the initial manufacturer of the elevator. If a building owner decides to change elevator maintenance companies, the elevator company, the successor elevator company, will not be able to access this critical maintenance information to comply with this bill. Therefore, we encourage the council to modify the bill to enable the successor elevator company to access this critical information from 
the prior elevator company software system. Thank you again for giving us the opportunity to testify today, and we are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. I think you're next. Good morning, Councilmember Powers. My name is Zach Steinberg. I'm a Vice President of the Real Estate Board of New York, and we appreciate the opportunity to provide comments at the hearing. We agree with the Council that there is a continued need to assess elevator regulations and ensure the safety of residents, and some of the bills being heard today, including intros 414 and 786, work towards that shared goal. However, we have concerns about the potential consequences of other of the proposals under consideration. Specifically, intro 341 would require owners of existing buildings to install secondary power sources to power elevators and egress paths during emergencies. Unfortunately, many of our members who have considered the option of installing a secondary power source with the ability to power an elevator have found that doing so in existing structures is incredibly challenging. That's the case because on the structural side, the weight and space required to install a generator is significant, and many older buildings do not have the space to do so. Regulatory issues also complicate the ability to do so. And in some older landmark buildings, for example, a device would have to clear regulatory layers to ensure compliance with zoning, landmark, and safety regulations. Our members have found that the approval process for this can take as much as three years to complete. Finally, the cost to install these systems can easily reach into the six or seven figures, posing a real burden for many buildings. As an alternative, we would urge the Council to allow the Department of Buildings the opportunity to engage technical experts to determine a more practical course of action as part of its revision of the exi existing building and construction codes. Given the hearing's focus on elevators, we also want to call your attention to another important issue that is not being covered in the hearing, but it was discussed earlier in questions about the building code requirement that all automatic passenger and freight elevators be equipped with a system to monitor and prevent movement of elevators with open doors by January 1st, 2020. We are concerned that reaching full compliance with this deadline is not practical and should be addressed by the Council and the Department. This is the case primarily because the existing workforce is not able to perform all of the work required to bring the city's elevator stock into full compliance over the next eight months. We have, contrary to what you may have heard earlier, submitted evidence to both the Department of Buildings and the City Council documenting this challenge facing the workforce. We've also provided evidence stating that the, the six-year required timeline for compliance that was discussed earlier is not actually a full six years because product on the, was not available on the market for a number of years following the imposition of the requirement. Therefore, we think bringing this, all the elevators in the city to this standard require far more hours of work than the, than the labor force can actually complete by the end of this year. We also understand from the Department of Buildings that an owner's ongoing work to modernize an elevator or elevator fleet is not going to be considered to be proof of compliance with the requirement. Elevator modernizations are lengthy projects, and buildings that are in the process of modernizing their elevator fleet may have some individual elevators that are not in compliance with the requirement by the end of the year. We do not believe it is in the city's interest to penalize owners who are making significant investments to modernize their elevators in this way. Therefore, we believe that extending the compliance deadline is warranted, and in the case of elevator fleets undergoing modernizations, we believe it would be appropriate for DOB to allow permit applications of elevator modernizations filed before the compliance deadline to be proof of compliance so long as the owner submits regular compliance reports to the city until the full elevator is brought into compliance with the full provision. Finally, we would like to reiterate comments we have provided previously to the Council on the Construction Safety Act. We are fully supportive of regulations that improve construction safety and our members are working hard to meet the training requirements imposed by the bill. We have consistently raised a concern of the training capacity challenges, especially for day laborers, MWBEs, and others. Therefore, we support the Council's decision to extend the compliance dates, and we urge that the Council carefully consider whether this extension alone will be sufficient to ensure that the estimated 180,000 construction workers can meet the requirements of that act. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and our full testimony is submitted in writing as well. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Jim Duffy. I'm representing the Elevator Conference of New York, and I'm obviously outclassed here because I'm um, really, a, I'm speaking specifically to intro 341 and the emergency power li of lighting for egress and elevators. Currently, when they do a modernization right now, we're required to put in an, uh, a backup power supply for the light in itself. As far as the uh, emergency generator backup power, that's between, as far as from the industry panel, between the, the DOB and the building ownership. Um, as far as 414 and, 
was it? I'm sorry. In, oh, uh, 414 and 565, uh, it's not an elevator industry issue. It's more of a building owner's issue. Okay, and then going on to intro 786 about brake monitoring. I think this is a big misconception presently in the elevator industry. A brake monitor is that we, we actually know with a contact closure that the brake is set or it's disengaged, okay? As far as monitoring and what specifics, that would have to be explained uh, further. And that could be a very expensive situation. And again, we look forward as an industry to the outcome of the DOB study. Uh, in 787, uh, the listing there, there with the bank, we currently do a lot of this maintenance we're tasked with the fact of doing it as a test, but prior to this, we were doing this as part of our maintenance control program, okay? And the last part of that, elevator monitoring, this would have to be explored. As someone put, it could be a very, very expensive thing. There's systems, usually you see this type of thing in big, big complexes, as opposed to, say, six-story buildings and stuff like that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you for all your testimony. I think we have written copies as well. Uh, okay, thank you. The chair, this uh, hearing is adjourned as your fill-in chair. Thanks.